So uh, my wife Kelsey and I have four daughters, and so, so we like to go to vacation in the Adirondacks. There we are with the, with the girls in 2016. My favorite part of this is Emily's uh, eyes. Uh, you can't, if you have children, you know you can never get one photo where everybody is smiling just right, right? So this is, this is us, this is actually seven years ago, and the first time we took our whole family was actually sooner than that. It was when the kids were much younger. Back when we first went to the Adirondacks, I could carry Emily on my back when we went hiking. How many of you have been to the Adirondacks, you know, and, and enjoyed that? Yeah, maybe about half of us here. Well, if you've never been there, you, it's hard to describe how massive it is. We've been going for 12, 13, 14 years, and there are parts of the Adirondack Park we have never been in. If you look at this map in New York State, you can see that uh, it covers six million, oh, go back, go back, go back to the big green one, please. Uh, there we go, six million acres. The Adirondack Park is about a fifth of the total space in New York State. It's the largest protected area in the contiguous 48 states and the Adirondack Park right here in New York State is bigger than Yosemite, it's bigger than Yellowstone, it's bigger than the Everglades, it's bigger than the Grand Canyon, and in fact, it's not bigger than any one of those, it's bigger than all four of those put together. That's pretty wild, right? I'm not getting any kickback from the tourism board for New York State, by the way. Uh, although if they're open to that, I am too. So this is a big space. And, and having young children, I thought that if we're going to go and we're going to do hiking and, you know, there's bears and all sorts of things, you know, we should prepare a little bit. At least I should. So I called my buddy, who is a federal agent and an avid outdoorsman. He's been trained, you know, by the world's best training of how to survive in the wilderness. And he told me, okay, if you're gonna go, this is a place I love to go, but I want you to do this. First, stick to the trails. Second, have a compass, have water, have a couple of different ways to start a fire, have this kind of knife and that kind of knife, have a flashlight and extra batteries. And I was like, I love gear. I, I love like little doodads and gadgets and things. Like, I, like this, is, this is my jam. So I'm like, okay, I could do all of that. Like the, the kid and like the 12-year-old boy, the Boy Scout in me was like, yeah. So I got a little backpack and I'm like calculating how much water we need and all that. But then... He told me something that changed the way I thought about taking my family on these hikes. It made me change the way I thought about venturing into these remote areas. He said, now we can look at the little red dot. Look at the map of where you're hiking. So, so we go up to Old Forge, and if you look, the, that yellow line, if you can see that red dot towards the bottom, that's where we we're going to go hiking at Bald Mountain. Bald Mountain is one of the most popular places in the southern central Adirondacks to hike. But my friend said, hey, listen, you know, you've got this one road, and, and it feels like you're around a whole bunch of people. And it feels like it's safe because it's an established trail. And if you take, uh, if you veer off of the left of this trail, you're going to just run into a road. But if you veer off the right-hand side of this trail, and you just look at, draw a line in your mind from that red dot to the next road, between 50 and 70 miles of wilderness is what's between you taking a step off of that trail to you coming into contact, most likely, with another human. And then, before I took my little backpack with some Band-Aids and granola bars in it, 
and my precious family out into the great big woods, he said, most unsolved missing persons cases in New York State where they never find the body happen here. That made me think twice, three times, about how ready I was to navigate our little hike. That's why when you hike in the Adirondacks and in some other places, you'll find these trail markers that, that help you keep going the right way. And even if it's starting to get dark, you can, you can pick those out with a flashlight. And as long as you can find the next one, and the next one, you should be able to find your way there and back. I love hiking. My favorite part of being on vacation is, is taking that time to be in the woods and to experience God's creation, to, to smell that fresh air and to finally work so hard and you know, break a sweat and get to a peak where there's a beautiful view and that, that wind just kind of washes over you. And, and there's times where you can take hikes up there and you can't see a single man-made structure on the whole horizon. That's cool to me. But it's easy for me to forget how quickly I can lose my way. And that's true about actually hiking in the woods, and it's true about my life, right? This became very real to me one day when we were on that very popular hike. This hike that all sorts of people will just, you know, they'll, like, they'll eat breakfast in town, they're at a restaurant, or, you know, it's like they drive by the water park, and then, and then boom, 10 minutes, and they're at this trailhead. And there were so many people the day we took this hike. It was too close to July 4th weekend when everybody and their brother was there. And there were so many people on the trail, it was bothering me. I mean, like, I love people, but I don't want you on my trail. I, I, like, I came here for the woods not to say, hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? Halfway up the mountain this particular day, we heard people shouting. That's not good. And we quickly realized as we made our way towards them to see what was the matter, that they were looking for their son. He was a teenager, and what do teenagers want to do? What did I want to do when I was a teenager, Mom? Not walk with my family. I wanted to run ahead. I, wanted to, I was like, I'll find my own trail. I'll make my own trail. Well, Jimmy made his own trail away from the trail. And the parents were trying so hard. You could see it in their eyes as we said, can we help look? You could see they're trying to hold it together. They're trying not to panic. But, but you could tell by the way they, they called, J Jimmy! They knew this didn't have to end well. You know, what's true in our lives is that not everybody who wanders is found again. We've all gotten off the trail before. You may have had this experience where, you know, you were just walking along in your life and, and you were paying so much attention. It's easy to do this. It's easy to stop looking at the trail markers. It's easy to stop paying attention to the people you're with because you're a little ahead or a little behind. and You're just looking at the next route and the next rock that you have to step over. And you could just kind of veer off. You could start making small decisions in your life that lead you off of the path. And one small decision after another that leads you away. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you paused and you kind of assessed your life and where you were at and, and you turned around, you looked and the spaces you were in didn't find yourself in a familiar spot? And you knew that you had been just kind of like on autopilot for a little while. And listen, I've never gotten anywhere I wanted to go by drifting. I've never gotten anywhere I wanted to go with the Lord, with my life, with my relationships by just kind of being an autopilot. And you might be in a spot today where in a certain area of your life you're like, I don't know where I am. How did I get here? And how do I find my way back? Maybe that's the way you feel about your faith or your family, or your finances. 
Maybe that's the way you're thinking about like, if I don't know really where I am now, how am I gonna actually navigate the future? So do you know, with all the uncertainty in your life, do do you know where you're headed? Do Do you know that you're headed the right way? And by the way, how many moms here are wondering if they ever found Jimmy? Anybody? I kind of left you hanging there. Okay, they did. We did find Jimmy. Yeah, praise God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How many dads completely forgot about Jimmy already? You're like, you're like, hey, he'll, he'll figure it out. He's a smart kid. <laughs> he'll, he'll come home by the time he gets hungry. <laughs> he uses resources. <laughs> Well, when we open up the Bible, we see that the Lord invites us into a relationship which we call a walk with him. And if you're not sure, if your life is on track, if you're actually dialed in to the directions that God has for you in each area of your life, I'd like to invite you to listen to what uh, Jesus says in the most quoted sermon ever in history, the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, we read this. Enter through, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads where? To destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Where? Are you headed in your life? If you calculate the trajectory of your relationships, are you moving in the direction of God's chosen, God's preferred future for you? If you take the current trajectory, the current course that you're on, and you extend that, are you going to wind up at the destination you want to? Are you on the broad road? I ask this because we all know that anybody walking anywhere will get somewhere. Thank you, Captain Obvious. But, but, you got to think about it because a road that leads to destruction is not the road you want to be on. And here's the thing, and what Jesus says about the, the path, the road that leads to destruction, there's a lot of people on it. You can just go along with the herd. You don't have to really pay attention. You could just kind of go with the crowd. It's a well-worn path. There's not a lot of obstacles in your way. You could just go that way, but you're not going to like where it ends. Are you headed down the path that everybody's headed down? Or are you walking with Jesus? The first part of of us talking about you discovering what true north is, is this idea of prioritizing the Lord with every step, because every step that he invites you into leads to life. But that's not the common way of life. God's ways are so different than the world's ways. The narrow path is so distinct from the broad road. It actually, you can't do it yourself. You cannot walk God's ways on your own power. You will never make it. It takes the Holy Spirit of God living in you to go Jesus' way. But Jesus will take you to destinations if you will learn to come and and go to the grave with him and be raised to new life in him and be full of the Holy Spirit and navigate by his word in his ways. He'll take you to places you do want to go. Kelsey and I were driving in rural Kentucky one time. We were, uh, you know, young and in love and first married. And we we lived in uh, south of Lexington. So the trip we were coming back from, the map... And when I say the map, I mean 
the paper map that we folded up and kept in the glove box. We didn't even have MapQuest. Uh, it showed that we had to go all the way up to Lexington and then back down to where we lived. And on the map, it said, oh, there's this little road that goes from here to here is a shortcut. So we said, let's take the shortcut. So we're barreling down this two-lane road in rural Kentucky, and we're just having a great time and not paying attention to the signs. Uh, have you ever not paid attention to the signs in your life? And, and now when you look back, you're like, there were signs. I just ignored them. Well, there were signs. We just were ignoring the signs. We we're, just, we're just having a great time driving. And we, we waved to this one family that was sitting on their porch, and they looked at us like we were crazy. We couldn't figure it out until we turned around this bend and locked up the brakes because the road stopped when it ran into the river. And I was like, what's happening? And there was a sign that says, ferry closed for the day. And I was like, what? Like, nobody, t like, this wasn't on the map. This is an obstacle. And so, you know, this is all to say that not every road that you can take will lead you somewhere you want to go. It's true in life, and it's true in general. There's a specific way Jesus says to walk that leads to life. In fact, he says in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this, so the way is not just a set of rules, it's not just a principles to live by. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus says another outrageous thing here, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if people wanted to, and people do, they say, but Jesus, that's narrow-minded. Don't all religions say the same thing? The answer is no. Just do the most rudimentary study of the major world religions. They do not say the same thing. Don't all roads lead to heaven? No, they don't. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if you look at what Jesus actually said, he says lots of things that are really hard to accept, lots of things that are exclusive. But Jesus isn't interested in leading you just anywhere. Jesus insists, because he is the truth, he insists on telling you the truth about the reality of life. Both now and what he wants for you for forever. And while the world will tell you that every path is equal, that's not biblical. Jesus says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and what he wants, because he is life, is to lead you to life. Jesus' radical claim about being the way is consistent with what God has always said. God is always, if you read the Bible from the start to the finish, God has always claimed an exclusive relationship with the people he calls to follow him. God doesn't want to be added on to your life like a YouTube channel you subscribe to and then forget about. God doesn't want to be the app that you download and you access sometimes, like when you have a problem. He wants to be the operating system for your life, the platform on which all other applications are running. The Lord doesn't want to be your favorite choice on the menu. He wants to become your life, the sustenance that you feed on every moment, and he has the credibility for this claim to make sense. And I want you to see that there's a distinct difference, that there's a big difference between Jesus and the enemy of our souls. Because you have an enemy of your soul that's trying to convince you to walk a path that's other than God's path. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this. He makes this contrast, this comparison. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And some of you have been letting the thief, the enemy of your soul, the devil, steal, kill, and destroy for too long. And Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Think about the difference between these two words. 
promise, compromise. You know the phrase compromise has the word promise in it? And the devil is never going to come to you if you're a believer in Jesus. He's never going to come to you and say, hey, why don't you worship the devil? Because you're like, no, I'm worshiping the Lord. But he's like, hey, how about you just scoot my way a little bit? You can have all of the life. You just have to have, the, you just have to come close enough to shake my hand. You just have to dial it down a little bit. You can have Jesus without all of that lordship stuff. You can, you can have God, and you can live a life that pleases him, but you don't have to pay attention to him in this area of your life. You know, you know as you navigate your life, you have choices to make. The thief offers compromises. That means you just have to come close and just, just scoot in his way a little bit. But the shortcuts that he offers you, even if they look good in the short term, will always lead to dead ends. But if you'll take the less popular path, Jesus makes radical claims on your life and he he delivers on radical promises. He doesn't advertise a comfortable life. Jesus is never gonna say to you, just you just come my way and it'll all be rainbows and lollipops. He offers you a cross. and resurrection. Life. He's your good shepherd who knows the way to life and he wants the absolute best for you and he proved it when he lived a life that was perfect and then just because he loved you so much, he was willing to lay down all of his perfection for all of your imperfection. You can trust God. I know it's scary. And I know there's places in your life where you're like, but if I trust him in this, like I'm afraid he'll take me to death. And I'm like, yeah, he will. Like not maybe, he will. But if you go to the grave with Jesus, you'll rise with Jesus too. You can trust God, making his voice your top priority because why? He loves you. Think about way back when God first formed a people for himself. In Exodus chapter 20, he rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and he brought them out into the desert and he came down onto a mountain and he said, Moses, come up here. I'm gonna give you what it looks like to live in my ways. And he said this. This is what we call the first commandment, Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. He says, I am the Lord, your God who brought you out of Egypt. And your Lord, the God, wants to bring you out of where you've been in slavery and into a life that's truly life. He says, I brought you out of the land of slavery. You know what he says next? You shall have no other gods before me. You see, God's claim on your life is directly proportional to his willingness. It's not about yours. It's not about you. It's not about how great your faith is. It's about how great he is. God's claim on your life is directly proportional to his willingness to commit to saving you. So do you think it's reasonable for the God who moved heaven and earth to save you, for him to say, today, to you, not back thousands of years ago, not Moses in the mountain, but for you today, to look at Jesus Christ in the face, and for him to say, you shall have no other gods before me, because I'm the only God that loves you, and I'm the only God that leads to life. I don't want to claim your life, I want to resurrect you. John loved Jesus. He followed Jesus in life, and he followed Jesus all the way through his life. And at the end, when it was, he was getting old, he wrote this in 1 John 5, 21. He says, dear children, addressing the people he loved, he says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And listen, I know people who live around here who have little statues and little shrines that they bow down to legitimately, like they actually do. 
But more likely for you, an idol's gonna be anything you prioritize over the Lord. Is an addiction running your life? That's in first place, that's your idol. Is, is, is your pursuit of sex, is that your idol? It's never gonna satisfy. What about your pursuit of success? Or money? Or approval? Or maybe the devil's been so calculating in your life to take the good things, the best thing God wants to do, your marriage and your children, and your plan for your life, and to put those at the top, and everything else is spoiled because God's not in his rightful place on the throne of your heart. Prioritizing your life God's way means be, begins with putting no other gods before the Lord. And I've got three, a few application questions. Would you agree with this statement? If Jesus is God, then I should prioritize him with my life. In general, would you agree if he is God? We should do what he says, right? Well, let's run through this, and I want to make sure we have time, because we're going to call you, we're going to give you an opportunity today to pray with one of our praying folks, because in this room, we have many different reasons we need to, we need to step forward and pray with somebody for his strength to trust the Lord. How would you fill in this blank? I will trust God with careful because there's an alternative question and a lot of times the case with folks who are like me who have been in the church and read the Bible a lot we just say everything okay I hope so that's where we're going but this is a more revealing question sometimes how would you fill in this blank I will not trust God with that place I got hurt. The way I perceive God let me down. The uncertainty of my future. The financial mess I'm in. I asked people on Facebook this week, what's the hardest thing to trust God with? The overwhelming majority of them were parents, and they said, my children. But what is it for you? What is so precious in your life that you're afraid that if you put this in God's hand, if you, if you listen, if you have a white-knuckle grip on anything in your life, you could be idolizing that thing. What would it look like if I did? Let's ask this question. The promise of Jesus, life and peace is available for you today. Even if you haven't experienced it yet, this could be the day. If you, if you will be sensitive to him and ask this question, what would it look like if I did trust God? Let's go right to the core. With my identity. With my sexuality. What if I trust God with my friendships? What would it look like for my time or my money to be his to direct as he points out in scripture? What does it look like for me to trust God with my marriage? What about that place where I'm, I'm having a hard time forgiving? And I'm afraid that if I do, I'll go down a road I don't want to go. There's past hurts, future hopes and dreams. What if you today took the step, if you're not in a saving relationship with Jesus, you can pray with one of our folks. Praying folks, why don't you take your places in the room so people can see where you're going to be standing. Go ahead. What if I actually could trust God? Today can be the day you trust in Jesus for the first time. Or if there's a specific area of your life that's difficult to trust the Lord with, you can pray with one of these folks. You know, and I challenge you to trust God, to take a step, even if you don't know what it could look like. I challenge you, as we sing the last song today, 
to just come and trust God enough to take a step forward and to pray with one of our folks. These are good people. If you don't know them, uh, don't worry, I do. Pastor Marisa knows them. And I have prayed with each one of them and would pray so you can trust them. When you're walking through life, the best way not to get lost is to stay found, to look around and keep your bearings about where you are. And so I just want to tell you this. We learn to trust God one step at a time. If you believe he loves you, you can take a step and pray with one of these folks about the part of your life that God's talking to you about as I've been talking. Can I pray for you? Go ahead and stand up if you would. If you know you want to pray with one of these people, then go ahead and you can come forward. Uh, make your way to anyone. They're in the back. They're in the front. Anyone with a yellow name tag on. Uh, we've got lots of folks to pray with. But I want to pray for courage for you to step out of where you are and to come pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the way that you love us. I pray that you will give us boldness and not let anything, uh, other people's opinions of us or fear or anything like that keep us from actually taking the next step. Uh, we trust you to point out to us where we need to take that next step of trust. And uh, we pray, whether it's in our health, in relationships, in our finances, or giving our life to Jesus, pray that you will minister to us right now in his name. Amen. <laughs>